about Wafia. Are you there? Or Ellen? Yeah, Wafia is there. Yes, Wafia. Yeah, I was not there. You're not there in the last class. Please don't miss classes, otherwise. Okay, then Ellen. I think Ellen was there. So I don't think I was there as well. You were also not there in the last class? No, sir. Okay, uh, that's... Okay, I remember. Memuna? A quick summary. Memuna or Madhya, anyone would like to take on? Okay, I think those who were there are not today present. Okay, so uh, yes, yeah, so we did we, we talked about uh, energy flow in the last class, and where I told you about PAR, which is which is a concept called as photosynthet photosynthetically active radiation. This simply means that uh, everything that sun gives to the ecosystem in, in the form of radiation is not used by the primary producers, which is plants, okay, for production of uh, biomass or starch in the, in the ecosystem. So only what is used by the, the primary producers is called PAR, which is the, the radiation spectrum which can make photosynthesis happen. So photosynthetically active radiation is called PAR. And it is around half of the radiation that we get from sun. And it also makes sense because I also taught you that not all, all uh, wavelengths of visible light is able to activate the photosynthesis reaction center in plants, correct? Only some specific lights, uh, and there were, there were two extremes at which this was happening. One was around the bluish light, and the other one was greenish, I'm sorry, uh, more of orangish light. So these were the two regions where chlorophyll A is most active, and when it absorbs this radiation, it becomes uh, it makes photosynthesis happen. So PAR, PAR is the is the reason that energy flows through one ecosystem to, uh, sorry, one trophic level in an ecosystem ecosystem to another trophic level in that ecosystem. Now this energy flow we study through food chain. Okay, so the energy flow is when one organism eats the other. So in a living world every living system has to eat another living system. The exceptions are bacteria that can have a chemosynthetic mode of nutrition where they do not need to rely on living other living systems for food, but they can just take the, the uh, inorganic components directly from their environment, which is required. Whereas other, other kind of life uh, relies on other living sources. So there are two kind of food chains that we discussed. One is called the, the grazing food chain where we do not take into consideration the decomposers or the saprophy, uh, saprotrophs or the saprophytes. So we consider plants as primary producers in a grazing food chain. Then comes herbivores which are primary um, consumers and then comes carnivores which are secondary consumers. You can also include a tertiary consumer where which 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 can be a 
apex carnivore or the apex predator or sometimes omnivores also in a food chain like human human are omnivores so we can be a tertiary consumer okay so if energy goes from primary producers to primary consumers to secondary consumers and it's not coming back to the plants that kind of system is called grazing food chain if we include decomposers which act at every level so decomposers decompose everything which is dead and decaying and bring the energy back to soil and in a in a way they are bringing all that energy back to to plants right plants can use it and again this chain will continue so more like a chain it becomes a cycle because it's it's connected so that's called detritus food chain okay because we are using we are including detritivores or the decomposers in that food chain okay this part is clear everyone the two the two type of food chains are clear to all yes okay very well then we went on to understand food web and food web is just give me one second people yeah so food web is just the interconnections of multiple food chains because in nature it's not like one food chain is is uh, exclusive of another food chain so everything is connected so this the same grass or the same kind of plant can be grazed by multiple different herbivores and multiple different herbivores can be grazed by same or multiple different carnivores and so on so food web is the natural interconnections of multiple food chains in the nature and this is how this is a more realistic picture of trophic levels set how trophic levels are set up in nature now coming to trophic level trophic level is simply the word trophic is associated with nutrition or food so how an organism gets nutrition or food is called its uh, its trophic system so trophic level is where organisms are arranged or they they occupy different places or different hierarchy in the food chain okay which which kind of organisms will be the primary producers mostly the photosynthetic ones which will be the primary consumers secondary consumers tertiary and so on so that's called trophic level and another concept which was important is of standing crop so it is more or less uh, uh, standing crop is the total organic matter or total biomass which is present or available at each trophic level at one particular time okay so standing crop standing crop can increase or decrease based on how there are changes in the food chain for example let's say there were 5000 uh, rabbits in a in a particular jungle okay so for that trophic level and these rabbits were feeding on let's say carrots so there are carrots then there are rabbits and then there are foxes that hunt down the rabbits and let's say eat it eat them okay so at there are three trophic levels that we established so there will be a standing crop of carrots the total biomass of carrots that will sustain the total biomass of rabbits that will sustain the total biomass of foxes so if the standing crop amount of carrots change it will also change the standing crop amount of the rabbits correct if if next year there is no carrot in the jungle and let's assume that rabbits only feed on carrot which is not a uh, like true in nature but let's say it's a defining factor then the rabbit population will go down and the standing crop or the total biomass of rabbit will decline okay it can also uh, decline if the carrot population is same but if the fox population increases because there will be more predation then and still rabbit population with the same amount of carrot population can still decline so multiple changes at multiple levels in a trophic level Uh, in a trophic um, pyramid can lead to change in the standing crop of different components is that clear make sense people yeah. and 
then coming to ecological pyramids which is which i told you that a uh, uh, erect pyramid we see uh, upright pyramid we see for three things when we are studying biomass when we are studying number of individuals and when we are studying energy flow for these three there is a erect or upward pyramid that we see in nature okay but there is one exception of a inverted pyramid of biomass okay so biomass can have a inverted pyramid but it is only seen in uh, limited number of examples so one such example is which is the most common where a small biomass of phytoplankton can make a larger biomass of zooplankton sustain and uh, and the same amount of zooplankton can sustain even higher biomass of fish so if you take all the phytoplanktons all the zooplanktons and all the fish and see their biomass fish will have the highest biomass okay so it come but phytoplanktons are at a primary level they are primary producers zooplanktons are primary consumers who eat on phytoplanktons and then fishes are the secondary consumers okay so you will see that this is a inverted biomass pyramid okay but in this case also i told you that the pyramid for biomass can be inverted but the pyramid for energy flow even in this system will always be upright okay so phytoplanktons with a small biomass will have a huge energy that's how they are sustaining a higher biomass of zooplanktons so and also keep in mind that with every trophic level when energy flows from primary producers to primary consumers and from primary consumers to secondary consumers there is always some energy loss that happens okay that loss happens in repair wear tear just maintaining the body temperature or if if nothing at all then just respiratory loss because when we respire we um, remove co2 we we exhale out co2 okay so there will always be a loss of energy so the pyramid of energy can never be inverted okay that's one thing you should always know then we talked about ecological succession and succession simply means um, the gradual and predictable change in the species composition so one species compose one species go down and the other species come and take up the throne kind of so that's why the word succession so succession of the kings happen right similarly su succession of species happen in ecology whenever there is a gradual and predictable change in the given region now there are two kind of successions one is called primary and one is called secondary primary succession is where there was no life to begin with okay that's called a bare lifeless region for example let's say a rock or a mountain which had no plantation no life and then slowly with change in the factors that can support life like moisture water then some spores can flow of like some phytoplankton some bacteria can get deposited there and now they start finding optimum environment and they start growing so a, a, a place which was lifeless now starts having life and that's called primary succession but it's very very slow okay it's very slow and the species that start invading that bare region first time are called the pioneer species just the word pioneer means that pioneers are those who started that field from scratch so life started from scratch let's say in a region and it's done by some species and it's pioneer species okay and finally uh, there in plants two reasons is yeah just one question is in the chat samara is saying that this part is yes so samara from the board's perspective it is so that's why i'm not um, putting more time on it but you should know these important concepts so that's why we are not going through everything but just the important concept that can still be asked if you're giving entrances okay from this chapter okay is that is that fine samara yes even nutrient cycle is uh, i think nutrient cycle is there right 
or is it also omitted from your board syllabus? Sir, it's deleted. Phosphorus and carbon both is deleted. Yes, sir. Okay, cool, no problem. So, in plants, there can be two type of successions. Either the succession is going from this is secondary succession now, which we are talking about. So there was already a life to begin with, but then it changed over time. So that can happen in a way where in the beginning there was a hydric condition. Hydric means water rich. And it started slowing. Uh, it's slowly the species that were native started dying and some other species started taking over. So the succession can either go into from hydric to mesic conditions, which is from water rich to water neutral. This is called hydrarch succession. Or in dry regions, it can be xerarch succession. So in wet, it's called hydrarch because wet means water and hydro means water. Dry, it's called xerarch because in dry, it goes from xeric conditions to mesic conditions. But in both the cases, the succession moves towards a more optimal and mesic uh, middle kind of environment. Okay. So these are a few things you need to know and understand in this chapter. Anyone has any doubts from this chapter? So I'll stop here for a couple of minutes and I will take questions if there, if there are any. You can go through and decide if you have any doubts. Otherwise, we'll begin with the next chapter, Biodiversity. Any question, people? Can you all see the screen that I am sharing? Okay. So let's begin this. Now, so the, the penultimate chapter of your syllabus talks about biodiversity and its conservation. So there will be two parts. Again, it's a, it's a more um, just conceptual chapter, not much of things in detail. But you have to understand certain things about biodiversity because we have studied about ecology, populations, organism, population dynamics, and also about uh, uh, interactions. So all of this together make a biodiversity. And as the word tells, the word bio means life, diversity means variations. So biodiversity means all the different variants or variation in the life form on the planet. Okay, it includes all your ecological um, uh, ecological niche and ecosystems that we have studied in the last chapter. And it also means that even in the same habitat, you will see difference or differences in the number of species. So what we are going to focus in this chapter is that why is there so much of diversity? Okay, so till now, if you if you understand about life, so let me write this variation of life forms. And so much of variation and why we have to conserve all. You know, 
why can't we just conserve let's say if i so you all must have heard the story of noah's ark right if it comes to saving the planet they say that uh, the most simple solution is take one pair of every species put it on a ship and take it to somewhere else okay you can grow the whole ecosystem back but will it really work because if you say that one species one male and female of elephant one male and female of giraffe one male and female of xyz then you are not taking into account the biodiversity because if we see planet earth we have somewhere around 1.3 million species that we have reported till now right this is the reported species 1.3 million okay different species of life forms out of this 1.3 million which let's say makes the 100% which we have figured out till now and according to um you know computational predictions uh, mathematical predictions we could have somewhere around 7 million to 8 million species on on the planet that we have not figured out till now okay so but out of this which we already know you will be surprised to know that around 70% is animals okay like they belong to animal kingdom when i say animals i don't only mean animals the animal kingdom so 30% belongs to other kingdom of higher life forms king and also out of this if i consider this 70% which belongs to animal kingdom as the total animal population out of this also 70% a whooping 70% are insects so when we talk about noah's ark we are not saving the insects which are the 70% of animal life on the planet and are, it's so huge that there are more than 30000 of ant species that we just know okay around and when i say these are different kind of ants for every species there'll be billions of ants on the planet so and if you go to look at beetles beetles are even higher lot so they are around 10 folds higher than ants so there are around 3 lakh beetle species okay even not just on land even in water if you see we have more than 28000 species of fish that we have we have figured it figured out till now okay and within the species i'm not even talking about the the sub species or the varieties okay because in in the chapter biotechnology where we read about genetically modified crops we studied about breeds and varieties of plants and animals where i told you that for the for the handful of rice species that we have we have more than 50000 varieties of the same or a handful of species so that's how big the biodiversity is okay so it's not easy to you know take make a replica of the biodiversity save one species of one pair of each species put it on a ship and take it somewhere else and start life it's much more complex than that so that's why they say that they, there can never be a planet b so all you have to do is to conserve the one that you got so that's why conservation is the most important thing we the the world as whole is focusing on and should focus on so if we, if you want to for example point of view let's define biodiversity first right down biodiversity is the large 
the large amount of heterogeneity large amount of heterogeneity among the life forms among the life forms in the biosphere of planet earth the biosphere of planet earth okay and remember i'm talking about this 1.3 million species now this term biodiversity was if you just want to remember it for entrances the term was coined by edward wilson he was a sociobiologist okay so he coined the term biodiversity okay now this dio this diversity in life forms can be resolved or refined to any level or any depth or complexity as we want to go in so you can say that at the level of let's go top to down so at the level of planet earth has three major different zones or regions in which we we you know kind of divide earth one is called the tropical region or the tropical zone which is around the equator between the tropic of cancer and tropic of capricorn and as you go farther towards the north or the south pole there comes the temperate zone then the second one in each north hemisphere and south hemisphere and then there is the tundra tundra zone which is near the north pole and the south pole right which is mostly ice or very very cold so ranging from very hot to very cold there are different kind of habitats on planet earth which give rise to different ecosystems within those ecosystems there are different kind of species within those species there are different um uh, organisms that have adapted uh, differently you know and within those different organisms which belong to different species if you go at the level of uh, physiology you will see very very diverse physiology very different kind of organs very different kind of mimicry techniques very different kind of eating habits very different kind of uh, uh, anatomical structures etc even within the same organism if you go at the level of tissues and cells you will find different kind of proteins so there is lots of diversity in proteins that function inside a cell also and there is lots of heterogeneity in the genetic material like the number of genes that we have so humans have somewhere around 28000 genes and organisms can have more or less than that gene and can have very different genes that are not present in other organisms so the the diversity in life form ranges from genetic to molecular to cellular to tissue to organ to organism to habitat ecosystem or to the whole you know you know um, at, at the planet level as well but to make things simple for you because you have to give board exams you don't have to worry too much Uh, it's not possible to study everything so relax and what we will be focusing on 
is uh, just a moment. Yes. So we will be focusing on three um, uh, levels of biological organization. So we will be talking about three levels of biological organization for its diversity. The first we will be talking about genetic diversity. Okay, to represent the very small, the genetic diversity. Okay, and what is genetic diversity? Where a single species, okay, might show a great diversity at the genetic level because of its distributional range, and that is seen. So you you will you will look at certain animals or plants for that matter and you will think that because the same species is growing in different regions you will think that oh they 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 look so different their structures will be so different uh, like if it is a plant their fruits will be so different that you will think that they are two different species but ultimately you will realize no they just look different but they are same species you know just today only i was educated on this topic by one of my very brilliant colleague where she told me that the same species of a bird can have lots of diversity you know in terms of the phenotype and genotype because it, it depends on season it, it depends on uh, the phenotypic diversity depends on season it also depends on the location in which they live the geographical location on the basis of which there can be even genotypic diversity so the example that your book talks about is about medicinal plants. So there are lots of medicinal plants that grow in the Himalayan region, the whole belt of the Himalayan region. And if you grow the same species in different, um, different uh, dis uh, geographical distribution, you will see that they, to adapt, in order to adapt, they will undergo genetic uh, uh, diversity. Okay, they will adapt some different expression protein, a different expression of certain genes and proteins, and some will become more heat tolerant because in Himalayas you don't have heat, but the same species growing in near the equator might be might have to tolerate some heat. Some will tolerate for uh, less water conditions, uh, so forth and so on and so forth. So that that is called genetic diversity among the same species. Okay, so right on. Genetic diversity means the single a single species showing a single species showing high diversity at the genetic level. A single species. Sorry. showing high diversity at genetic level due to its distributional range due to its you can also write geographical distributional range. Geographical distribution is one factor, okay? History, which mainly affects the genotype range, okay? The phenotype is even more plastic, as I told you, more than genotype. So if you go one level down with the same genetics, with the same genotype, organisms can, sh can show different phenotypes, right? And that depends on season, their behavior, mating, uh, breeding season, et cetera, et cetera, even their diets. So with the same genotype, a bird on a different kind of diet, let's say eating more beetles, 
versus a bird, bird which is eating more seeds, these two populations can have different phenotype, different color of their wings, different plumage, etc. So, but we have to restrict to genetic diversity for your course, for your syllabus. So this is one. You can give examples of plants like mango. So you know about different, different varieties of mango. Sometimes they are all the same species. For example, Mangifera indica grown in different geographical distributions. They, they have different kind of fruits. They are, they are, the fruit tastes different. The color is different. Even the size of the mango plant is different. The canopy is different, etc., etc. Okay, so there are more than around, around 1,000 varieties of mangoes alone in India, and more than 50,000 varieties of rice alone in India, and most of them belong to the same species, which is your uh, Oriza, the the Oriza sativa. Yes. Okay. So Oriza sativa have lots of varieties and Mangifera indica, which is mango, has lots of varieties. Okay. The second level at, at which there is lots of diversity, then let's go to one level up, which is species diversity. Okay. So what I mean by species diversity is now, what we will do is uh, we will, take two similar habitats or two habitats and compare species richness in those habitats. So for example, let's say um, if you know about the, the, the two deserts, the two kinds of deserts, let's say one desert of India and another desert of Africa, both are desert conditions, desert ecosystems. But you will see, see that in one, the kind of species the, of reptiles, so reptiles can adapt to live in very dry deserts, right? Snakes and lizards. But you will see that there are more reptile species in one desert condition as compared to other. That is species diversity. Another example is the Eastern and the Western Ghats of India. These two uh, get very heavy rainfall, both of these two forests, okay? And because of this heavy rainfall, lots of amphibian lives there because amphibians have to rely on water also to complete their life cycle. So if you compare between the Eastern Ghat and the Western Ghats, you will see that the Western Ghats have a greater amphibian diversity, uh, a species diversity than the Eastern Ghats. Okay, so lots of amphibians live in Western Ghat as compared to Eastern Ghat. So that is species diversity in between two different uh, similar kind of uh, habitats. So write down. It is the diversity at the species level. Diversity at the species level and compared between when compared between two similar habitats or ecosystems. Okay, an example is the Western Ghats having higher spe uh, higher amphibian species than eastern ghat okay And then we come to the one, another level up, and that is the ecological diversity. Okay. And this is where you compare between two different countries or two different uh, continents, subcontinents, two different areas altogether, and you see how many different ecosystems are there 
for example if you take india as an example and compare india with any european country which is mostly in the temperate uh, zone you will see that india has deserts has mountains mountain ecosystem has rainforests uh, in the northeast has marshy uh, um, forest in the sundarbans also have a plateau delta region also have beaches desert and grasslands plains everything so india is more ecologically rich as compared to a country in europe or a, a colder country like like you say uh, finland or norway or or italy okay so that is where ecological diversity comes into picture so write down it is the diversity at the ecosystem level diversity at the ecosystem level okay and can write down an example india has greater ecosystem diversity india has greater ecosystem diversity than finland or norway or ireland anything like or our neighbors pakistan sri lanka can also compare <clears throat> okay another important thing that you have to understand in this is this chapter is how these biodiversities are set like does do they have a pattern or they are really stochastic like anywhere you can have any kind of diversity so after a global analysis of this biodiversity ecologists and evolutionary biologists realized that it has a pattern you can actually see patterns in biodiversity so what are the patterns of biodiversity it simply means first to figure out the pattern we have to understand what are the factors that can uh, lead to a greater biodiversity or a lesser biodiversity so as i said i give you an example of india having greater ecosystem diversity than finland or norway or europe in general so this also means that india will have greater number of species for every kind of Uh, an organism like greater species number for plants greater species number for amphibians reptiles mammals birds right yeah but why is that because one factor that governs it is the latitude latitudinal gradient okay so what is latitude latitude and longitude from your geography lessons people anyone what is the latitude what is the longitude come on quickly i don't think it's that difficult right yes so let me try to make it i'm not very good with diagrams but let's say this is this is earth and as we know that earth is not uh, like it's not revolving 
at a very straight like it's slightly tilted its angle of rotation sorry it's not rotating the angle of rotation is slightly tilted and it's exactly 23.5 degrees tilted if i'm not wrong so this tilt leads to some regions getting more uh, daylight than other regions in fact some regions on the planet gets constant light for months okay with low intensity of course so the sun always stays at horizon it never goes down the horizon because of this tilt you know so some regions are in constant light while on the other opposite end if the earth is tilted towards the sun let's say so the north is tilted towards the sun so the north will have a constant light for several months and the south extreme south pole will have constant darkness for several months okay but uh, because the south pole is not very habitable like the earth south pole which is antarctica it's not habitable we don't find uh, organisms there but in the north we find organisms like there are uh, organisms that have that are living there but earth in general is divided into these regions as i was talking about this is equator the red lines that i'm making is the tropic lines tropic of cancer and tropic of capricorn so tropic of cancer is the one that passes through india correct yeah so this region between the tropic and the pole is the tundra this region these two are called tropical regions tropical tundra and in between is the sorry there will also be a line here in between is the temperate region now this how this latitudinal gradient works is that you will find that the diversity of plants and animals are not uniform as i said on the planet but is higher or it's more in the tropical region so this is the first point right now the tropical region the tropical region has a greater or a higher has a higher biodiversity as compared to temperate region okay and accordingly the temperate region will have higher diversity as compared to the polar regions so it goes like this so tropical regions has the highest then comes temperate and lowest is in the polar or the tundra but why is that why do you think is this a case why do we have very low diversity in temperate and polar regions any idea any thought yes samara yeah so if you if you say that one of the reason could be uh, because as we go far towards the polar regions the polar ice caps the environment become more and more less and less um, favorable and more and more hostile right extreme i should say but then i can argue back and say that though it is more uh, 
extreme, but there are organisms that have adapted to live in the extreme environment. Why not they have a lot of species there? So for example, um, if that would have been the case, we will, we will find altogether very few organisms surviving there. But we have organisms like polar bear, right? We also have normal bear or uh, normal uh, uh, other uh, tropical mammals from the bear family. But you find that in the bear family, also there are many species, right? But we find most of the species living in the tropical jungles, very few living in the temperate and even fewer, just a handful or I, 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 if I'm not wrong, just three or four in the tropics. Why is that? Why not polar bear have 50 different species of polar bear in the tropics? Because polar bear can live in the, sorry, uh, in the tundra, in the polar. Because polar bears can live there. Walrus, penguins can live there. Why the biodiversity is less? Though you are correct that it, it, it could be one of the factors, but not the most like not the major factor okay um, because in the last class we were discussing that um, there is also a limitation to body size only big organisms with bigger body size and mostly um, organisms which are more fluffy or roundish bulgy can survive better in the polar regions because they will have more fat and they can conserve their body heat better as compared to smaller organisms. So smaller organisms with lots of folds and uh, you know thin structures on their body won't survive in polar because those structures will lose heat very fast and the organisms will die. So that is one factor. But the most important factor is like uh, instability. So people thought about it for very long. And that's why this question came up. This question also was asked in board exams. So write down the question first, people. What is special about the tropics? What is special? about the tropics that accounts or that leads to or that accounts for its greater biodiversity its greater biodiversity so this is the question it's an important one from this chapter important one from this topic latitudinal gradient and write down the answer so Down the, the tropical region has remained. So let me explain this to you first. So what ecologists and evolutionary biologists have concluded on the basis of these studies, previous organisms, the fossil records also, is that biodiversity is a result of speciation, right? When we were discussing evolution in chapter seven, we were talking about speciation. And speciation is where one, uh, un, uh, a new species arises from a pre-existing species because of factors. M many, many factors are there for speciation. Even mutation can be one. But for speciation to happen effectively, you need a stable, uh, uh, environment like a stable what do you say mm, uh, stable habitat stable ecosystem yeah someone is writing something 
to help me? Yes, Madhya has written an answer, which is, which is, yes, bingo, the correct answer. So Madhya, let's, let's read Madhya's answer and discuss. So Madhya says the topics are less undisturbed than the temperate and polar regions. You mean to say the tropics are less disturbed, okay? Because less undisturbed means more disturbed, right? So the tropics are less disturbed than the temperate, which means they are more stable. Yeah, autocorrect sometimes messes things up. I can completely understand. Is so the tropics are less uh, less disturbed than the temperate and polar regions. And that's also one of the reasons. So what, yes, Madhya is correct. And what? let me just elaborate on that point. What she means to say is the tropics are more stable. And why are the temperate and polar regions more unstable? Because of the glacial events. So on the planet, multiple times, the cycle of freezing of the planet. If you have watched uh, Ice Age, people, you watched Ice Age? So Ice Age did not just happen once. Ice, there were multiple Ice Ages that has happened, which means the whole temperate and the tundra has frozen and then again melted, frozen and melted, okay? So that's called glaciation events, okay? Where lots of glaciers are formed at, an, at one point of time. So you must be knowing about Greenland. Greenland also has big mammals. And in the past, Greenland had mammoths, okay? Very big, heavy elephant or the ancestors of elephants, okay? How do you think these very, very big mammals, Greenland is an island in, in the middle of the sea, the Arctic Ocean. So how do you think these elephants reached that island? One uh, theory is that they evolved on that island independently. Then uh, the same species can, then, then it should, if it is just a, a isolated speciation event, then the same species should not be present on other places. For example, the speciation or the origin of marsupial mammals happened in Australia. That's why naturally we don't find them we don't find kangaroos in India, you know, in the wild. Uh, you can bring kangaroos and keep it in the zoos and things, but marsupial or pouched mammals originated. There are many species that just originated in the islands of Papua New Guinea. And when you go to Papua New Guinea, it's an island uh, in, the, in, the, in the tropics, I think, yes. And you will see species of birds that you will see nowhere else. Okay, so, but if there were big elephant ancestors, mammoths in Greenland, which is an island, how did they reach there? And they're also found on, they were also found because the fossils were found from other mainland areas like the US, like the America, the North America and the Europe. So clearly they did not, you know, swim that long a distance. So it gives you uh, a, a proof of principle that at one point of time, Greenland was connected with the Europe and even to the North America by just ice. So that whole Arctic Ocean was frozen and you could just walk on ice and go to places. Now it's melted and there are pockets formed. So that's what Madhya is trying to say that tropical is more stable in terms of no glaciation happening. Land were land, waters were water. In temperate and polar, lots of glaciation events happened, which did not allow a very stable ground for species to continue for millions of years in order to form various different species. So speciation events were less in the temperate and in the tropic, uh, in the tundra, as compared to they were in the tropic, tropics in, in these millions of years of evolution. That's why tropical ended up having a greater biodiversity and um, polar regions have, or temperate regions have less biodiversity. So let's write, uh, is this clear everyone? Thank you so much Madhya for that, that answer. Is, is this concept clear? Yes, sir. Okay, great. So let's write it down, write down um, the tropical region tropical region has remained 
relatively undisturbed has remained relatively undisturbed for millions of years as compared to the temperate and polar regions as compared to the temperate and polar regions as compared to temperate and polar regions which were subjected to frequent glaciation events which were subjected to frequent glaciation events which frequent which glaciation glaci glaciation g l a c i a t i o n s glaciation not s in the end glaciation events next point the stability of the tropical region the stability of the tropical region the stability of the tropical region led to led to higher speciation and greater biodiversity led to higher speciation and greater biodiversity okay is that clear everyone yes sir yeah so this was first reason uh, the, the answer is not yet complete the another reason is like uh, the my first point which is not extremes of weathers that also helps in survival of organisms but there is the second factor write down b and the second part of the answer is tropical environment are less fluctuating and more predictably constant tropical environments are less fluctuating and more predict uh, predictably constant okay and this helps constant and this helps sir can you repeat the third point from start please yes yes tropical environments are less fluctuating or you can say less seasonal they don't have very 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 extreme seasons so if you go to very tropical regions like beach area of india like towards the very south of india in south of india you will not see you know too too harsh winters or too harsh summers there will be humidity throughout the year with some temperature range that will go up and down but it will be narrower as compared to temperate regions which are hot during the like summers going into the 30s and going sub zero during the winters so that's called seasonal fluctuation 
so the tropical environments are less seasonal or less fluctuating and more predictably constant you can predict better more predictably constant this constant environment promotes this the constant more predictably constant constant and this constant environment promotes niche specialization <clears throat> i'm writing this this word for you niche we have studied this word right when we were studying organism that's why i introduced this niche and habitat right niche specialization so when they delete syllabus they don't take this into account that the same concept is used later on so niche special uh, the, the this constant environment promotes niche specialization and species diversity and species diversity okay another uh, one more thing you can add that constant environment also uh, promotes higher productivity which is not directly associated but indirectly associated just like one last line constant environment also promotes higher productivity and then your answer is complete so this is the only question and the most important question that can be asked from latitudinal gradient of pattern of biodiversity <clears throat> is it is the answer done everyone is this part clear yes tell me yeah okay great the second thing that affect uh, that decides the patterns of biodiversity is species area relationship first was latitudinal gradient second is species area relationship now this concept was uh, studied in the south american jungles like and there were naturalists that observed and this states that within any region okay that you are studying any particular country any jungle that you are studying the richness of the species how many species will be there it increases when you increase the explored area like if you go and explore more and more area you will see that more and more species you will discover okay so in a less area uh, you can find more number of individuals but most of the time those individuals will belong to a few species only okay make sense so if you keep on expanding but that also has a limit it's not like you keep on expanding and you will find more and more and more species so that way uh, there will be too many species too much species than we estimate so there is a limit to that also after one point of time you 
stop finding more and more species but you start finding more and more individuals of every species okay so let's let's define it first write down the species area relationship states states that it states that within within a defined region within a defined region the species richness species richness means diversity right the species richness increases with increasing the explored area with it increase in the explored area but up to a limit so it also has a limit this is what it states okay so which means if you find if i represent it in a graph where this is the species richness and x axis is the area okay you see that it first increases as you increase the area then it becomes stable and it starts decreasing this is called a rectangular hyperbola this kind of graph is known as a rectangular hyperbola So let's try to define it mathematically first. So if I try to describe the same relationship with the equation simply. So let's say again I'm making it. So let me take S as species richness. Okay. Let me make it here. So that we can use the right hand side for mathematical equation and let's say this is defined as s and the area is a okay now if i say s is equal to then a how it's related to a is then there will be a c raised to the power z sorry no a will raise to the power z so let me write c first c a raised to the power z in this equation s is species richness as i said c is the y intercept okay here on this y line a is area under study and z is your slope 
of the line slope of line also known as regression coefficient again this is a important mathematical thing that matters in this chapter don't have to worry about uh, other things a lot so if you plot a graph for this you will see that as i said first it will increase right but after one point of time it will become constant now this line this line is for this equation okay in this line you can see that as the area increases the species increases but after one point of time you see that it's constant right here so this is the maximum number of species that you can find uh, this is the limit that we were talking about even if you keep on going keep on increasing the area you may not find many species but here the problem is that this graph behaves differently in this segment differently in this segment and differently in this segment the slope is different right so this z changes here is different here it's different here it's different correct so what we do to this kind of equation to like linearize it is called we linearize the equation in mathematics have you heard of linearizing the equation so what you can do you can use log log s is equal to log c and when it is a raised to power z anything raised to power something then you write it as plus this power comes down z into log of a correct so this becomes a linearized equation for which if you plot a graph you will get a linear graph which is more better this right a linear graph so this graph is for this equation here the z is a constant it's one thing it's constant throughout okay now you can take z as a constant thing and you can define various uh, regions and how 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 much species richness you can see or you can expect there you can also predict on the basis of this slope so let's say there is a region where you find more species so the z will be more and you will see that the graph will be steeper correct so this graph denotes that within the less amount of area you have more species but here to reach the same amount of species you have to find more area so that is a difference can you see the difference everyone yes sir yeah so write down first z uh, uh, the slope of the line in the bracket write down the z value the slope of the line or the z value is smaller for a smaller region the slope of the line is smaller for a smaller region around 0.1 to 0.2 this is what we normally see the slope of the region is smaller for smaller region and is greater for a larger region like a continent so if you are studying a small country like any european country 
you will find that the z value for a ecological study to find species there will be less and the graph will be less steeper like this will be the graph but you will find that for a whole continent if you do the study it will be higher and you will have a steeper graph okay and is greater for a greater area around 1 to 1 1.2 also so that's how the z value tells us about the species richness and area relationship that is the second factor that defines geographic uh, sorry uh, patterns of biodiversity so a steeper slope means higher number of species found per like unit area so if i take area as this if i fit fix area at this point you will see that for a steeper graph which is this one there is more species but for a less steeper graph there is less species right is it clear everyone yes sir yeah cool so okay a lot so these are the two important concepts in this chapter and after this the chapter talks about the importance of diversity why should we have diversity and this is very clear because uh, we depend on a lot of products a so lot of man made products including medicines you know around 25% of our medicines that we use that are available in the market Uh, depends on some plant product so we have taken those chemicals or extracted those chemicals from plant sources so if diversity is lost we will lose a lot of um things not just food but also medicine and other kind of important raw materials from nature that we get so we have to conserve biodiversity and then the other part the in the, in the last part of the chapter talks about how to conserve biodiversity why should we conserve and how should we conserve biodiversity okay so there are two methods of conserving in situ and ex situ that we will talk about so these uh, we will talk about in the next class and uh, in the next class probably we'll also finish the chapter because this was the main point so uh, everyone understood this